Good afternoon. I hope this finds everybody and all your loved ones healthy and safe. Thank you for joining us. The Berkeley Law Development and Alumni Relations Department is launching a new virtual debate series it's for our alumni, and they're calling it the Great Debate. And the intent of the series is to create a space for civil and constructive discourse on today's most challenging issues from varied viewpoints. To me, this is what university and a law school should be all about, the expression of different viewpoints and a civil, very much a opportunity to explore ideas manner. I want to thank the alumni office for arranging this. The goal is to be do a debate each semester between competing viewpoints. I want to thank my colleague, John Yu, for participating in this initial debate. And as I said, I want to thank all of you for attending. Um, our format is going to be that I'm going to speak initially for 15 minutes, then John's going to speak for 15 minutes, then we'll each get a five minute rebuttal, and then we'll open it up for questions. Our primary focus is going to be about President Trump and executive power. We've been asked by so many people to also address the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, and we'll be doing that as well. And so without further ado, we should start the debate. As for executive power, my thesis is that President Trump's unlimited view of executive power is inconsistent with the Constitution and is dangerous. My view of separation of powers is that generally and to the greatest extent possible, two branches of government should be involved in taking any major action. Passing a law takes the involvement of Congress and the president. Spending money, which requires a law, takes the involvement of Congress and the president. Going to war should involve Congress and the president. Enforcing a law should require actions of the president, the executive branch, and the courts. To me, that's the core of checks and balances and what separation of powers is all about. It is clear that Donald Trump rejects this view of separation of powers. He said, for example, and I quote, when somebody is president of the United States, the authority is total. Indeed, on many occasions, he has uttered this. Such a statement is inconsistent, the most basic principles of limited presidential power. It is consistent with the idea of a king or a dictator, not a democracy. I could spend my time reading such general quotes from President Trump, but I think it's more effective if we talk about examples. There are many I could give where President Trump has exceeded any reasonable bounds of executive power. I would go through three examples. The first is his funding the border wall without congressional approval. Everyone recalls the facts. President Trump promised as a candidate they wanted to build a wall between the United States and Mexico. He asked Congress to provide $5.7 billion in funding for this wall. Congress, even with a Republican majority in the House and the Senate, refused to do so. In December of 2018 and January of 2019, the federal government was shut for 35 days because of this impasse. That's the longest shutdown in American history of the federal government. Finally, President Trump capitulated. He agreed to a bill that would give only $1.35 billion for the border wall. Then President Trump on his own shifted money from other parts of the Defense Department budget to fund his border wall. I think this is clearly unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has been clear that Congress has the power of the purse, not the president. For example, in Office of Personnel Management versus Richmond in 1990, the Supreme Court said, the straightforward command of the Appropriations Clause means that no money can be paid out of the Treasury unless it has been appropriated by act of Congress. Congress refused to appropriate that money. So how does the Trump administration justify doing this? They point to section 8005 of the Defense Department 2009 Appropriation Act. This is the only ground that they've pointed to in court. I wanna read you that language. It says, upon determination of the Secretary of Defense that such action is necessary in the national interest, 
He may, with the approval of the Office of Management Budget, transfer not to exceed $4 million of working capital to the Defense Department, provided that such authority to transfer may not be used unless for higher priority items based on unforeseen military requirements than those originally anticipated. And in no case, the item may be funds that were requested and denied by Congress. There are two requirements under this. It has to be unforeseen circumstances, and it can be that Congress has not made a choice to refuse the funding. But there's nothing unforeseen with regard to the border wall. President Trump was arguing that from the moment he declared his candidacy. Also, the law is clear that it cannot be appropriated in situations where Congress refused to spend the money. And they've done exactly that here. That's why the Ninth Circuit, in two cases in June of 2020, Sierra Club versus Trump and California versus Trump, said that President Trump violated the Constitution and the statute provided no authority for it. My second example, impounding funds for military aid for the Ukraine. If federal law appropriates money, the president has no authority to refuse to spend it. President Nixon claimed this authority. He said he could impound federal funds and not have to spend it. Every court without exception declared the impoundment unconstitutional. But to make sure it didn't happen, Congress passed the Impoundment Control Act of 1974. It specifically forbids the president from impounding money and refusing to spend it. That's exactly what the president did with regard to the military aid to Ukraine. President Trump had a conversation with the head of the Ukraine, Voldemort Zelensky, and he said, quote, I would like you to do us a favor though. He wanted Zelensky in the Ukraine to investigate Hunter Biden, to get dirt on the son of who he thought he'd be running against for president. Following this, the Office of Management Budget withheld the funds. This impoundment violated the constitution. It violated federal law. In fact, the General Accounting Office, in a report on January 16th, in the GAO's independence said, quote, faithful execution of law does not permit the president to substitute his own policy priorities for those Congress enacted into law. OMB withheld these funds for a policy reason which is not permitted under the Impoundment Control Act. Moreover, this was done for a corrupt motive. It was to help President Trump politically. Mick Mulvaney, the chief of staff said, it was a quid pro quo. Gordon Sondland, the US ambassador to the European Union, Fiona Hill from the National Security Council, William Taylor from the United States Embassy in the Ukraine, all said that military aid was meant to depend on the Ukraine gathering dirt on Hunter Biden. It violates the constitution. It violates basic principles of decency. Third example that I would mention was President Trump's gross mishandling of the coronavirus. 216,000 Americans have denied from the coronavirus. The United States is 4% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's deaths from coronavirus. If we had the death rate in Canada, 117,000 would have died. If we had the death rate of France, 96,000 have died. President Trump has inexcusably made a public health issue into a partisan one. He's unconscionably minimized the threat and caused many people to die. First, he falsely claimed the power to override state closure orders. President Trump said, for the purpose of creating conflict and confusion, some in the fake news media are saying it is the governor's decision to open up the states, not that of the president of the United States and the federal government. Let it be fully understood that is incorrect. It is the decision of the president. The president has no authority to countermand actions that governors take for the sake of public health. The Public Health Act in section 264 allows preventing people from coming into the country or traveling from state to state if health and human service deems there's a threat of spreading communicable disease. But ordering opening of businesses doesn't achieve that. In fact, section E says, nothing the federal government does can preempt state or local law. President Trump threatened to withhold federal funds if schools didn't open and if business didn't open. Some states followed President Trump's commands, reopened to disastrous consequences. But second, President Trump here lied to the American people. On so many occasions, President Trump said to the American people, quote, 
it's going to appear. One day a miracle will have disappear. He says constantly that it's fading away. He said 99% of coronavirus cases are harmless. When we know from the World Health Organization, 15% are severe and 5% are critical. He said children are virtually immune. Well, we know from what he said to Bob Woodward that he did all of these statements, knowing them to be false, misleading the American people, putting people's lives in danger. Why is the United States death rate higher than anywhere else in the world? Why does the United States have 4% of the population and 25% of the world's COVID deaths? Because of Donald Trump's failure to fulfill his constitutional duty. I have picked three examples. I could go through so many more. I could talk about how he's violated the emoluments clause of the Constitution from the moment he took office. I could talk about his executive orders in light of the stimulus package not passing. I could talk about his obstruction of justice with regard to the Mueller probe, his obstruction of justice with regard to Roger Stone and Michael Flynn. Or I could talk about just how last week he said he wants Attorney General Barr to prosecute Obama, Biden, and Clinton. Going after one's political enemies to the Justice Department is what you see in other countries that aren't ones that are democracies. Well, I also said I would briefly talk about Amy Coney Barrett, and I'll do so quickly. Um, I just want to make the general point, Amy Coney Barrett should not be confirmed at this point by the United States Senate. Two reasons. First, the stunning inexcusable hypocrisy of the Republicans. In 2016, Senator McConnell said, the American people should have a voice in the selection of the next Supreme Court justice. Therefore, this vacancy shall not be filled until we have a new president. However, Within an hour after Justice Ginsburg's death was announced, the Senate Majority Leader McConnell said, we're gonna go forward with a confirmation. Never before has there been a confirmation so close to an election. On October 12th, 1864, Chief Justice Roger Taney died. Lincoln said he wouldn't fill the vacancy. He would let whoever won the presidential election do that. In 1956, in October, Sherman Minton resigned from the Supreme Court. What did Dwight Eisenhower do? He made a recess appointment on October 15th of 1956 of a Democrat, William Brennan, to the court, leaving the newly elected president to fill the vacancy. But second, Barrett's views are so far out of the judicial mainstream, she should be rejected. In 1987, Robert Bork was rejected because of extremely conservative views. Amy Coney Barrett's are just as conservative, not more so. Presidents can pick based on ideology, but so can the Senate reject someone based on ideology. 20% of presidential nominations for the Supreme Court rejected in the 19th century. In the 20th century, John Parker was rejected in 1931 for his conservative views. Clement Hainsworth and Harold Carswell in 1969, Robert Bork in 1987. Amy Coney Barrett is as conservative as any federal judge in the United States. Sometimes we have to guess as to what someone's ideology will be when on the court. Because of Amy Coney Barrett's scholarly writings and opinions on the Seventh Circuit, we don't have to guess. She is going to be the fifth vote to overrule Roe versus Wade. I know at her confirmation hearings, she said she wouldn't express a view on how she'd vote on that. But she did say repeatedly that she is an originalist and her views are the same as Justice Scalia's. Justice Scalia was the foremost advocate for overruling Roe. In fact, I challenge anyone to find an originalist with Amy Coney Barrett or Antonin Scalia's views who believe there's a right to abortion in the Constitution. I think she could well be the fifth vote to strike down the Affordable Care Act. It's an issue that's going to be before the Supreme Court the week after the election. Amy Coney Barrett was very critical of the Supreme Court's 2012 decision that upheld the Affordable Care Act. Amy Coney Barrett could well be a fifth vote to overrule the Supreme Court's decision Oberfeld versus Hodges that protected a right to marry. Just last week, just Thomas and Alito reiterated that thought it was wrongly decided. Chief Justice Roberts vehemently dissented, the only dissent he's ever read from the bench. And Justice Gorsuch wrote an opinion in 2017 where he said it was wrong. Amy Coney Barrett is a law professor said it was wrongly decided. At the very least, I think Amy Coney Barrett will be part of a court 
that will allow discrimination against gays and lesbians in the marketplace, in the workplace, by those who have religious objections on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. I don't think people ever should be able to discriminate against others, including on account of religion. For over a half century, our society has said that protection from discrimination is more important than the freedom to discriminate, but not with Amy Coney Barrett on the court. Amy Coney Barrett is not a moderate conservative. Amy Coney Bar Barrett is from the far right. She is as far to the left as any judge, as far to the right as any judge in the United States. It's on this basis that she should not be confirmed. And so in conclusion, what I've tried to argue is that we have a president who has a very dangerous view of executive power. He's appointed a justice who undoubtedly is gonna be confirmed, who's gonna be very dangerous for all of our constitutional rights. So I'll just go right into it then. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, Erwin and the Dean, who is the Dean for uh, inviting me to participate in this great debate. I'm glad to see so many of you are there. Uh, based on the kind of enrollments Erwin gets, let me check how many of you have signed up, 380. So that's about two of Erwin's classes and probably more than all the students I have ever taught in 25 years at Berkeley Law if I've been doing my job right and trying to take as many sabbaticals as possible. So it's wonderful uh, to be with you. I hope, uh, I hope this is a great uh, opportunity for all of us to uh, remind ourselves why we have so much uh, affection uh, for this great institution we're a part of. I was just uh, thinking just uh, last week again how great this university is. We won, uh, we won more Nobel Prizes as a university than any other country in the world other than the United States last week. I think that's an incredible uh, commentary how much excellence goes on here and I certainly think it goes on at the law school. Uh, you also see that I resisted the overwhelming urge to interrupt, cajole, and mock Irwin during the debate. Um, I'm told now that this is not an effective debating tactic. So I purposely put myself on silent However, I can't promise those of you who've been in my classes and have done the Socratic method that I was similarly restrained. For that, I apologize now that you've all graduated, but I'm still going to try to get away with it here at school now. So let me uh, address uh, two, uh, two broad themes, uh, this question of presidential power and why I disagree with Irwin. But I do wanna stress, and I hope all of you also uh, take to heart the idea that the view of presidential power that I hold or Irwin holds or that you all hold should not change based on which party or which individual is in office. So as many of you know, I've been a vigorous defender of the presidency. Uh, I thought I vigorously defended almost every aspect uh, uh, that I agreed with him on with, uh, for President Obama just as much as I have with President uh, Bush or President Trump or President uh, Clinton for that matter. Uh, especially in the area that I've worked on the most, which is uh, war powers. So I hope, or fully expect to the extent many of you think that President Trump has gone too far in exercising presidential power, or President Bush did, that you will be equally critical of a President Biden, which the polls seem to suggest is going to be more and more likely. Uh, and I'll be there defending President Biden from all of you who disagree with Trump or Bush. So let me um, discuss maybe a broader scope before I respond to the three uh, examples that Erwin raised about uh, what I think the role of the presidency is. And I think it's quite different than Erwin. So I think Erwin has expressed what is often called the checks and balances approach to the separation of powers. Uh, it's actually uh, very similar to the English constitutional approach to the separation of powers that existed at the time of the revolution. And that was this idea that the three branches of government should participate in every major government decision because at least in the English system, they represented the three different classes of society, right? the Lords, the Monarch and the House of Commons. Uh, if that were true, if we had followed that approach, then Irwin might be right. But I don't think that is the system our constitution adopts. It adopts a separation of powers idea. You can see there are some places where the founders did want to mix 
uh, those power, the involvement of the branches and those powers. So for example, the appointments clause or the treaty clause, which were exclusively executive under the British constitution are more shared under the American constitution. But I would say, and this is the approach that Alexander Hamilton uh, first articulated uh, right in 1789, right at the beginning of the Constitution, and then again, and then again in um, 1793 at the time of the issuance of the Neutrality Proclamation. Uh, and we know Hamilton is right because they've made a popular musical about him. So he's always right now, at least in California and Hollywood. Hamilton's view was that each of the three branches is vested with the legislative, executive, or judicial power, depending on the branch and that they are to exercise the powers that were traditionally understood to fall within those definitions. So the executive power, all of it that exists in the federal government would be exercised by the president. All of the judicial power that existed at the federal level would be exercised by the courts. And that um, the exceptions in the constitution were transfers away or removals or limitations, but they weren't uh, thought to be the entire list of everything the president could do or everything the courts uh, could do. If Irwin were right, we wouldn't actually need a president. And this was actually something the founders debated in Philadelphia and during the ratifying conventions. If really you want the decision of Congress and another branch, why not just have a system like our other peer countries in the world who almost all have a parliamentary system with no independent executive branch. Where you go to the United Kingdom or Germany, why not just have a system where the winner of the elections in Congress uh, becomes not just the prime minister, but also becomes the head of the executive branch. You could have an executive branch would just be a faithful agent of all the choices that Congress made. That's not the system that our founders adopted. In fact, they quite went on a great length that the executive power should be different and was different, that the character of the power is different, that you need a president, and this is, I'm almost quoting directly from the Federalist Papers here, um, you need a president because you need some part of the government, always in existence, that can act with what Hamilton called speed, decisiveness, energy, and executive, which he thought was, he says, so basically, that is the leading character of good government. And that energy Except it's necessary, and he says, in order to administer the government, to execute the laws, to defend the nation's security, and to handle things, emergencies, and so on, which the Congress could not anticipate in the future. So I think in some areas, particularly war and foreign affairs, uh, emergencies, those are going to be areas where the executive can act on its own. Uh, that is the theory. This is not some made up theory that Hamilton just came up with. This is, under, this is the theory that underlies Lincoln's entire approach to the Civil War as well. I think it underlies many of the things FDR did in the approach to World War II. And I think it is uh, underlaid a lot of what our presidents have done during the Cold War and the years since. So let me uh, take up the different examples um, that um, Erwin mentioned. But the larger picture I have of Trump is that Trump, and I'll concede right away, Trump has uh, been extremely disruptive to our political culture, to the way the president acts, the way he communicates with the people, the way he treats other institutions and groups and people. Uh, but what I want to argue is that there's a difference between his political nature and the way he acts politically and what he does constitutionally. And I would say he says lots of things, indefensible things, but does he actually do them? Does he actually take constitutional steps to carry them out? I think the Amy Coney Barrett example is a good one. Uh, here you have a vacancy that arises in the last year of a presidential term. Uh, presidents are free uh, to nominate people to fill those vacancies. They always have. I don't think a president ever has not nominated a person to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. If there are, it may be a handful of, of times. The question is really not about the president at all. It's really about the Senate, whether the Senate can uh, enforce a neutral rule that is just not uh, bare power, where it will choose to confirm people who are nominated in the last year of a presidency. I've seen uh, data, I didn't count it up myself, that says 
when the president and the Senate are controlled by the same party in the last year of a presidency, I think all but one of those vacancies have been filled on the Supreme Court. When they're held by different parties, I think you have a rate of less than half have been confirmed. Uh, you could have had hearings and then the Senate could have just voted down Merrick Garland, I suppose, four years ago, but instead it just chose not to have any hearings at all. And I went back and looked at some of the people who were confirmed in that last year. And if we'd had this rule uh, that just no one gets confirmed, regardless of whether the president or the Senate are from the same party, that would have deprived us of some of our greatest justices. Uh, so um, Irwin said that uh, this current nomination is the closest ever to an election. I think that's true if you look before the election. But what's amazing is that presidents and senates have confirmed people even after they've lost the election. So guess who that is? Chief Justice John Marshall, the greatest justice in American history. He was both named and confirmed to office weeks after Thomas Jefferson had won the election of 1800. Two other justices who I think are some of the greatest jurists we've ever had in our history, uh, Benjamin Cardozo and Louis Brandeis are also justices who are appointed and confirmed in the last year of a presidential term. And of course, those are times when the president and the Senate were controlled by the same political party. Let me turn to the, uh, oh, oh, sorry, what, what sometimes worries me actually is because Trump is so uh, politically disruptive, it actually encourages what I think of as attacks on very important constitutional norms by his opponents. So yes, you could have an argument about whether the Senate is being hypocritical or not, but I think goes too far, which is a, an overreaction, is the idea that in, uh, instead, if Democrats win the presidency and the Senate and the House, that we should increase the size of the Supreme Court by six justices so that there's 15 justices. I think that is a far more dangerous attack on constitutional norms than anything arising out of the Barrett appointment. Um, of course, constitutionally, Congress has the power to set the size of the federal courts and the number of justices on the Supreme Court. We've had the number nine since 1869. And I think even before that, we followed this norm that we should not try to tamper with the size of the court in order to manipulate it until we get the kind of results we want from it. I, 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 regardless of who's, I mean, FDR tried to do this in 1937. He might've got his way in the end, um, uh, by getting the court to switch on the Commerce Clause and the Spending and Taxing Doctrines. But I think it's a good thing he lost because I think if he had succeeded or if some people succeed, should uh, the elections turn out a certain way, I think you really have the chance that you start a spiral where both parties will start adding more and more justices to the court when they get in control. And then the courts are no longer going to be a neutral, uh, independent institution that uh, interprets the Constitution without regard to the political party then in power. If you were worried about minority rights, if you were worried about abortion, if you were about the issues that Irwin was mentioning, I would think this would be a disaster. I, I observe, I think that the uh, people who have traditionally been in favor of court packing have been people who've wanted to overturn Roe versus Wade or get rid of the decisions on school prayer and busing. And I'm glad that they lost in their efforts to increase the size of the courts at those times. So let me uh, just address briefly the three points that uh, Irwin raised about uh, presidential abuse of uh, power. The border wall, I think, is really interesting. Um, I don't think, regardless of what President Trump says uh, for political rhetoric, that constitutionally uh, the administration is really that far off base. Uh, they are claiming to use delegated powers from Congress. Uh, if President Trump were to say, I have the unilateral constitutional authority to spend money as I see fit, I would agree with everyone that would be unconstitutional. But actually, they're operating under two statutes. I was, I was just looking them up online again just to make sure I was right. Um, and always, whenever I look up anything online, it always tells me I'm right. But it says, right, that there are two statutes. If there's a declaration of a national emergency that the Department of Defense can, without any regard to any other provision of law, can start and stop uh, construction, operation, maintenance, civil works, military construction projects, and it can transfer funds between those programs. This is not something President Trump claimed he could do on his own. This is something that Congress has passed, and Congress has continued 
to refill those spending accounts, making it possible for President Trump to build his wall. Personally, I don't think the wall is terribly a good idea, but I do think that legally Trump has the authority to do it. But the question is not about presidential power. The question is really about do these statutes go as far as they appear to in their text. Congress, when it passed the National Emergencies Act in the 70s, could have tried to place limits on that, but they did not. The second, uh, second point I wanna address is the coronavirus. Here I find um, Irwin's criticism puzzling because I think Trump, again, to his political detriment, has actually recognized the limits of presidential power. He actually didn't try to close down or open all the businesses in the country. I would have thought that would be outside his powers under our federal division of authority between the federal and state governments. He has kept to the limited role that the federal government has in these kinds of public health emergencies, which is to provide funding, technical support, research, supplies, money. But what he doesn't have, what the federal government doesn't have is an authority just to run the entire public health system throughout the country. That is still up to the states and public. And, and I think President Trump, much to his political harm, has respected those limits. Do you think that it, uh, it would be a proper reading of um, the executive power to say that the president in this emergency can force every individual in the country to wear a mask or to close every business in the country? I think that would be well outside the president's power. I think it would be outside the power of the federal government. And I think Trump has recognized those limits. So in, uh, in close, I, I didn't get a chance to talk about Amy Coney Barrett in great detail, but I'd be happy to uh, in our uh, responses to each other. Uh, and I look forward to Erwin's comments and all of your questions. Thanks very much. My position is that President Trump's unlimited view of executive power is inconsistent with the Constitution and dangerous. President Trump said, quote, when somebody is president of the United States, the authority is total. Is that what John is defending? I'm defending checks and balances that at the great extent possible and generally, it should take two branches of government to be involved in anything. John says, that's the checks and balances theory. That's wrong. But what is he offering instead, other than the President Trump unlimited executive power view? I think that the unlimited executive power view is wrong from any perspective of constitutional interpretation. I'm not an originalist, but the framers clearly did not want to create a king like that. And I could quote James Madison, who rejected the Hamilton view that John puts forward. And I believe, second, that the structure of the Constitution is all about checks and balances. But I also think it's the best view of the Constitution. I think it is far better to make sure that two branches of government are involved than to let a president have unlimited unilateral authority. John then says, well, there'd be no need for a president. That's not right. We still need the president to be involved as the chief executive, using all of the powers the Constitution gives. So when it comes to declaring war, that's for Congress. But the president is then the commander in chief. The president gets to a point who's in the cabinet to administer the laws, who are the ambassadors, and all of the other things that an executive does. It's just a logical fallacy to say that unless you give the president unlimited powers, we don't need the president at all. He says, John says, we need speed and decisiveness. There are emergencies. I certainly agree with that, but it's a fallacy of composition to say that because sometimes we need the president to act in an emergency, therefore we are always going to reject checks and balances. I think checks and balances are the very core of what Article 1, Article 2, Article 3 of the Constitution are about. My three examples. First, funding the border wall without congressional approval. John says Congress has approved that. Not true. One statute that the Trump administration pointed to was the 2019 Military Authorization Act. Section 8005 has two requirements. It has to be unforeseen circumstances, and it can't be a situation where Congress refused funding. The Ninth Circuit points out neither of those are met. John points to a different emergency statute, not one invoked primarily by the Trump administration, but it allows money to be diverted if there's an emergency to build things to house troops and the like. It doesn't provide authority for building the border wall. It's not an emergency, but beyond not being an emergency and unforeseeable, it is specifically authority to transfer Department of Defense funds to build housing for soldiers, not to build a border wall. Second, I argue that impounding the funds for the military aid to the Ukraine 
It was a clear violation of separation of powers and a violation of the Impoundment Control Act. John doesn't discuss that. Third, I say there's a gross mishandling of the coronavirus. Why is it that the United States has 4% of the world's population and 25% of the world's deaths? I think Donald Trump deserves the blame for that. He falsely claimed the power to overrule closure orders. John says President Trump was restrained. He didn't do that. But he repeatedly threatened that state and local governments were going to lose federal funds unless they open, unless they open schools. His message, his threats, his use of the bully pulpit caused states to reopen when they shouldn't. And thousands, tens of thousands of people have died as a result. But he also lied to the American people. And I take that as a serious abuse of power. And I read you and could read you so many more quotes where President Trump minimized the threat of coronavirus, even though he told Bob Woodward he knew that was wrong. The president has the duty to take care of the laws that are faithfully executed. He has the duty to protect the United States. I think history will look very poorly on Donald Trump for how he made a public health issue a partisan one, and so many people have died as a result. Finally, in terms of the Amy Coney Barrett nomination, um, in terms of the, the stunning hypocrisy of Republicans, it was Mitch McConnell who said four years ago that they wouldn't consider Merrick Garland because it was an election year. My point is then that the Republicans should be consistent and not consider Amy Coney Barrett. John says he never knows of a president who didn't fill a vacancy. I gave you the examples. Lincoln didn't try to fill Tawney in the election year. Brennan was picked as a recess appointment by Eisenhower, a Democrat at that. Yes, there have been great justices who have been picked in election years. John is right about all of that. But I think what John here is ignoring is the context. If the Republicans were not going to confirm Merrick Garland in 2016's election year, they shouldn't be confirming Amy Coney Barrett. And besides that, Barrett's ideology, which I went through, makes her unacceptable. I'd be glad to have another debate with John about whether the size of the Supreme Court should be expanded, but that's not what this debate is about. Donald Trump is the most dangerous president we've had with regard to executive power, and Amy Coney Barrett is a real threat to all of our rights. So I, I do have a different vision. It's not the vision that uh, Irwin attributes to me about unlimited executive power. Uh, clearly executive can't do whatever he or she feels like, but how those limits are identified in a force, I think is different between us. I think Irwin thinks that uh, the separation of powers operates in this uh, two branch uh, way, which I don't see written anywhere in the constitution other when things like passing laws and there's a presidential veto, making a treaty or an appointment where you do actually explicitly see two branches involved. But if you actually look at the design of the constitution, the way the, federal, uh, the Federalists explained how it would work, including James Madison, I might add, they thought it would work differently than I think Irwin describes. They thought in the famous words of Madison, ambition would counteract ambition. They expected the branches using their constitutional powers to fight with each other all the time. And that that fighting would produce the limits on the government and would keep an important sphere of individual liberty free for all of us. And so take a uh, war or take the border. I think what's happened there is that Congress has plenty of constitutional power if it wants to use it to stop any president from going to war, to stop any president from building a wall. It has the power of the purse Congress has the power of legislation. It has complete power over the size of the military and its nature. I think what happens is that Congress just chooses not to use it. It's not that this is a constitutional failure. It's a political decision. Congress would much rather, as it does with construction of funds, it's not about housing, by the way. It says, may undertake military construction projects. That's the phrase from the statute. Congress could always change that legislation. Congress could choose not to fill the accounts that are involved here with money. Congress doesn't have to build a large military, standing military that's based all around the world that's designed for offensive operations as ours is. What Congress is doing, I think is quite typical. They are delegating power to the president. They don't wanna take political responsibility for tough choices. And then they're gonna blame the president uh, for 
whatever the policy is. And this is not just something that happens to Trump. This has been happening to presidents for at least since the end of the Cold War. Um, it's true, I didn't get a chance. I kind of ran out of time to cover all, uh, the, all three of Erwin's examples. Let me just mention the impeachment example. Right? We could have an argument, and we did, about whether what President Trump did with Ukraine, I admit, is unconventional. It was uh, norm-breaking. Was it an abuse of executive power? Well, we had an impeachment trial about that. Um, the House thought it was, a majority of the House thought it was, but President Trump was not convicted in the Senate. If the senators thought, and that's the mechanism set out in the Constitution primarily for the control of abuses of executive authority, not independent councils, which I think are quite unconstitutional to create an arm of the executive branch that exercises the, the power of prosecution investigations free of the control of the elected leadership of the country. Um, the impeachment power was created specifically by the founders, plus elections, right? The November elections are also a check on executive power, but the Senate chose not to convict, wasn't even close. Let me talk a little bit about Barrett, because I think um, McConnell and the Republicans four years ago did say that they would not confirm uh, Merrick Garland, who I thought was quite a qualified nominee, because they were the presidency and the Senate were controlled by different parties. And they did say that when they're controlled by the same party, a different rule might apply and had applied historically. Uh, that doesn't go one way or the other to Barrett's, uh, Bar Barrett's own fitness for office, but I think that's the rule. And I think when you're in the Senate, rather than the, sorry, Matt, the executive branch, the senators do try to come up with rules. I, I work there as an aide that apply regardless of whether Republicans and Democrats are in power. Quickly on Judge Barrett, I think, what else is she supposed to do to be qualified to serve on the Supreme Court? Right? She was first in her class at Notre Dame. She was a professor at Notre Dame, which is not a bad law school, clearly not as good as ours, but they're not bad. Right? She clerked at the Supreme Court. She was in private practice. She's been a lower court judge. She seems to have lived a life of upstanding moral character. Uh, what is so disqualifying about her? She has a view that many of the justices on the Supreme Court have. Under Irwin's standard, I think Irwin would retroactively like to remove uh, probably Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, and maybe Kavanaugh too from the Supreme Court because they're all, they all claim to be originalists, much like uh, Scalia was, much like Barrett is. I don't think she's out of the mainstream at all in the sense that if Trump were not to have picked her, he could have picked from a list of 40 or 50 other lower court judges now, you know, again, appointed by Trump who could, who have very similar uh, views. And I don't think this is some hidden uh, agenda because I think President Trump, for good or ill, four years ago, did issue a list of people he would appoint to the Supreme Court. They all have very similar views, I think, to Amy Coney Barrett. Um, it's one of the issues on which Trump campaigns. Actually, the main issue that a lot of conservatives, I think, swung to support Trump. Um, it's, a, it's an issue that the senators ran on two years ago. In fact, the Senate switched, I think three Senate seats switched because of the Kavanaugh hearings in the last election. I don't think it was any secret that the Senate under Mitch McConnell had been trying to rapidly confirm judges like uh, Barrett. But I think in the end, my hope is that the appointment for all of the faults that Irwin has mentioned will in the end be a healthy thing for the court because I personally would like to see the court return a lot of the questions that has been deciding to the political process, to elections, state houses, and congresses. And the reason that we have turned appointments into this kind of political campaign and why we talk about, think about the Supreme Court so much generally in the public rather than just amongst lawyers is because the court has expanded its power steadily over the last 30, 40 years to encompass more and more politically controversial, social and cultural issues. And I think those issues are the ones uh, that hopefully if they get returned back to the political process are going to mean the importance of Supreme, who's on the Supreme Court is not gonna matter to us so much anymore. Thank you. Whitney, do you want to take questions? Yes, absolutely. So we've received a number of questions. Hi, everyone. I'm Whitney. I'm Rowan's assistant. Uh, and I'll go ahead and read them to you, two of you. So first hey, off- Hey, wait, I want my assistant too. No, just kidding. <laughs> How damaging- I have no assistant. 
How damaging to the court long term would expanding the membership of the court be if Vice President Bi if Vice President Biden wins? Janet, do you want to continue since you were? Uh, I thought that was a question for you, <laughs> but I, I, I think I think it's extremely damaging. Uh, I think uh, the court. I think we as you know, we've tried it once or twice, and we've rejected it. We rejected it with FDR. Uh, that's why I think since 1869 we have set the number at nine. It doesn't have to be nine. What's more important that it just be fixed, and that it will not change. From my assistant just texted me saying he's going to take revenge on me now, which actually scares me far more than whatever anything Whitney and Irwin can do to me. So, uh, but we have decided since 1869 just to keep it fixed. It could be seven. It could be 11. If it were 15, I admit that is the only way Irwin and I are going to get on the Supreme Court is if they keep expanding the size of it so that there's just more people, more people should have a chance. But it seems to me, look, if, if you go down the spiral, because I have no doubt that the Republicans, if they get in charge again, will add more justices than the six that the Democrats want to suggest that they will add, you're going to get to a large Supreme Court and you're going to have a system where you, we treat the courts like executive branch agencies and we just expect them to carry out the uh, legal agenda of that administration for that period of time. And then when the parties switch, you're going to just add more justices. And I, I really worry that soon you, the courts will lose their independence and their institutional ability to stand up to the other branches, especially on questions like individual rights, which is what I think motivates a lot of people when they worry about the courts. I disagree with John on many levels here. First, what the Republicans have done in blocking Merrick Garland's nomination and rushing Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation is court packing. John mischaracterizes what Mitch McConnell said and what the Republicans said in 2016. I'll again read you McConnell's own words. The American people should have voice in this election, the next Supreme Court justice. Therefore, this vacancy should not be filled until we have a new president. Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham said, in an election year, we should let the people decide. And yet this year, having blocked Merrick Garland, they're rushing through Amy Coney Barrett. Second, John says he wants the court to play a restrained role, leave it to the states and the people. Well, if it's the states then, regulating guns. Do we really believe that Amy Coney Barrett and the conservatives are going to leave it to the people that have gun control? Or let's talk about campaign finance, how in Citizens United, the Supreme Court struck down a major campaign finance law. Was that leaving it to the political process? Or what about Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, where the Supreme Court made up a legal principle that has no constitutional foundation? to gut one of the most important laws adopted in my lifetime, the Voting Rights Act. These are not instances of the conservatives on the court following originalism or leaving things to the political process. These are things of their striking down what the political process has done. So it's in that context that I think we have to talk about the size of the Supreme Court. The size of the Supreme Court isn't set by statute, isn't set by the constitution, it's set by statute. It's varied from five to 10 over the course of American history. Nine is a historic accident. In the late 1860s, Congress did not want a terribly unpopular president, Andrew Johnson, to fill a seat on the Supreme Court. So the next time there's a vacancy, it will be eliminated. And it's been nine ever since. I readily accept that if the Democrats increase it to 13, the next time there'd be a Republican president and a Republican Congress, they might make 15 or 17. There is no magic number. But to me, the alternative is unilateral disarmament by Democrats. Amy Coney Barrett is 48 years old. If she remains on the Supreme Court until she's 87, the age was Justice Ginsburg died, she'll be a Supreme Court justice to the year 2059. Neil Gorsuch is 52, Brett Kavanaugh is 54, John Roberts is 65, Sam Alito is 70, Clarence Thomas is 72. The question is, do we want to accept not a moderately conservative court, but an extremely conservative court for the next decade or two? And what will that mean for abortion rights, for gay and lesbian rights? I don't think those rights should be left to the political process. So that's why I think Democrats have no choice, but to, if they win the presidency in Congress, consider expanding the size of the Supreme Court. 
So tacking on to this question, would either of you support term limits for justices? I guess I'll go first. I do favor 18-year non-renewable terms of Supreme Court justices. Um, I've argued this for years. Um, I have a book that came out in 2014 that argued for it. In part, it's because thankfully life expectancy is a lot longer now than it was in 1787. In 1787, the average life expectancy was 36 years old. Clarence Thomas was 43 when he was confirmed for the Supreme Court in 1991. If he remains on the court until he's 90, the age was just the Stevens retired, he will be a Supreme Court justice for 47 years. Elena Kagan, John Roberts were 50, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, 48. We're talking about people being on the court for over 40 years. That's too much power in a single person's hands for too long a period of time. Also, too much now depends on the accident of history. Richard Nixon had four vacancies in his first two years as president. Jimmy Carter had no vacancies in his four years as president. Barack Obama had two picks in eight years. Donald Trump has had three picks in less than four years. Since 1960, there have been 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president, almost even. But Republicans have picked 15 Supreme Court justices and Democrats have picked eight. That's just because of the accident of history. 18-year non renewable terms would mean a vacancy for a president to fill every two years, every president had the same influence over the size of the Supreme Court. Uh, I wouldn't change uh, anything in the Constitution unless there was some overwhelming evidence that it was producing a huge amount of problems. Because you can't tell, I can't tell, I don't think anyone can tell what the unforeseen consequences are of pulling one stick out of uh, you know, our wooden house and the effects it might have on other parts of the structure. Uh, th the reason most people give, I think, for wanting term limits is the idea that as justices get older, that their age and their health start to affect the quality of their work. And I, I, I believe that that was not true of Justice Ginsburg or of Justice Stevens, who are the, I believe they're the two oldest justices that have served in my lifetime. Um, I think that by the time uh, Justice Stevens left and Justice Ginsburg unfortunately passed away, they were still performing at a very high level of intellectual and legal quality. So what's the real problem? Uh, well, the real problem, it seems to me, the, the one that Irwin gave are more political, that it's unfair that certain presidents happen to get more appointments than other presidents. Uh, it seems unfair, it sounds to me, that uh, from his perspective, that uh, Republicans have been trying to appoint younger justices. I don't think that's a problem constitutionally. That's just a political issue. So why, for example, uh, don't Democrats appoint younger justices? They have been, right? Justice Kagan and Sotomayor were picked at a relatively young age based on the averages. They didn't do that with Justices Ginsburg or Breyer, however, but that was up to them. Uh, when the vacancies occur, of course, is a choice, but I think that's another reason why the judiciary is different than the executive branch. The executive branch, yes, you get a certain number of appointments every term when you come in and then everybody uh, has to resign or is fired and then you get to put your own people in. I don't see why the constitution has to guarantee a certain sort of political regularity to the appointment of Supreme Court judges or lower court judges too, right? Because I assume this rule would apply to every lower court judge as well. I'm all for having more people on the bench. Like I said, I'm, I'm waiting for my Supreme Court seat to be added uh, when we go from to nine to 16 to 28 or 30, but I don't think it's worth uh, messing around with the constitution in order to correct what I think is just a short-term political problem. Uh, so a question specifically for Dean Chemerinsky. Do you believe that the framers valued freedom from discrimination more highly than religious freedom? I don't believe that was true of the framers. After all, equal protection is not mentioned in the text of the Constitution. It didn't come along until the 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868. There is always a tension between liberty and equality. Any law that prohibits discrimination limits the freedom to discriminate. For a half century, our society has said that stopping discrimination is more important than freedom to discriminate. 
And to me, it doesn't matter whether somebody is discriminating on account of his or her political views or racist views or religious views. People should not be able to allow their views to justify discrimination against others. John, do you want to speak? I, I agree with Erwin on this, on his description of the founders. Obviously, the founders, unfortunately, very much agreed with racial discrimination. I mean, they allowed slavery to exist, and you have the, um, you know, the three-fifths rule, unfortunately. And it was not until it took the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments to uh, extirpate that from the constitutional text. But that doesn't answer which rights should have priority when they come into conflict. And so Erwin's quite right. I do think that as a country, we and in many judicial decisions, we have moved in a direction where um, the right to be free from discrimination and this equality idea is taken priority over an individual right. For example, uh, it doesn't have to be just religion. It could be speech too. It could be it could be any of them, I suppose. And so I worry that any of those rights gets gets priority over the the. Uh, and in that kind of conflict. So for example, if Erwin were right, that um, the right of equality should be able to prevail over a claim of freedom of religion, would that also be true of freedom of speech too? Would it be okay? I don't think this is Erwin's view. I mean, Erwin's been a very, I, I, I say we disagree on a lot of things. I, I enjoy disagreeing with him. Um, He's moved all around these universities, around the law schools. I think I've disagreed with him. Every time he's moved, I go and debate him somewhere nearby. But Erwin's um, been a stalwart, stalwart defender of the freedom of speech. I think I'm very proud of him for doing that when it's not the most popular view in the world, particularly on university campuses. But suppose universities did start to adopt these speech codes. We don't have it at Berkeley, but you read about them at other schools and it worries me to say, oh, the, our desire for equality uh, trumps the right of free speech, that there's certain kinds of speech, no matter how uh, you agree or disagree with it, which we are going to start to prohibit because it inflicts, right, this is the theory, inflicts uh, some kind of harm on people, uh, particularly uh, minorities. Uh, I don't want to hear people speak that way. I don't want them to come to campus, but I think they have a, a right to. But I worry that this idea that equality could trump religion uh, also means that Equality would trump the other rights that are right next to religion in the First Amendment. Do we have time for one more question or are we out of time? It's 12.59. It's up to you two. Would you like one more? Sure. It's up to one more question. I want to be respectful of the audience's time, though, too. We'll sneak in one more. Uh, let's see. So uh, since we did last one was for uh, Irwin, we'll go with one for Professor Yu. Uh, Professor Yu, accepting your argument that Professor Trump is spending border wall money pursuant to a reading of a statutory authority. He hasn't actually been elevated to being a professor yet. He's still only a president. president. <laughs> Sorry, President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Uh, uh, pursuant to a reading of a statutory authority, then presumably Congress could pass a Boland Amendment type statute to explicitly prevent spending on the wall. What would happen then? I think that's right. I thought the Boland Amendment was constitutional. I, I think if Congress wants to say we're not going to have any funds spent to, to fund a rebel group in Nicaragua or the Contras in El Salvador, then we're going to, then Congress has spoken and the president has to follow that. I do think if Congress were to say uh, we block all funding on any border wall construction, then the president has to carry that out. Uh, that's not what happened. And I do think if the president tried to do that, except maybe an emergency, like the outbreak of the Civil War, where Lincoln did spend money that wasn't appropriated. Only in that condition, I think, could a president do it. But otherwise, no, I think he has to follow or she has to follow Congress's dictates. The Congress has a, the complete plenary power of the purse. And that's what my point is. That's a really important check Congress can use anytime. It always uses it when it wants to. It just chooses not to. But that's exactly what Congress did. Congress considered appropriating money and refused to do so. The federal government shut down for 35 days as a result. In Youngstown Sheet and Two versus Sawyer, the Supreme Court said, and this was especially in Justice Frankfurter and Jackson's opinion, Congress considered giving the president the authority to seize industry. Congress didn't do so. It's clear from that. Neither of the two statutes provide authority for the president to do this. This is why the Ninth Circuit has said the shifting of funds for the border wall is unconstitutional. But also, 
I think the second example I mentioned shows how President Trump's view of executive power is so dangerous and unlimited. Congress did appropriate money for the Ukraine. The Constitution requires it be spent. The Empowerment Control Act requires it be spent. And President Trump, for his own political gain, didn't do so. John's only response to that was, well, the Senate acquitted President Trump. It's true, the Republicans in the Senate wouldn't remove President Trump for this. But that doesn't deny that what President Trump did there was a gross abuse of executive power. In fact, it's a gross abuse of executive power for the reasons John just said. Congress could spoke. Congress spoke and the president ignored it. Thank you both so much. I think that's all the time we have. Thanks, John, and thanks to Thank everyone, everyone for watching. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.